you and I were made for relationships with relationships with each other, but specifically for a relationship with our God, our creator, right? And sin is what breaks that relationship. It's when you and I choose to do something that we know is wrong and we separate ourselves willfully from God. Now, the good news is this. God didn't want to leave us in a state of separation from him. So he sent his son, Jesus, to die to take away our sins and give us a way to create, recreate that relationship, reestablish that relationship in such a way that God can actually live inside of us. He does not want to be a God who lives over there somewhere uh, and occasionally comes back uh, and, and interacts with us. He wants to be a God who's deeply, personally, intimately related to you and to I. And he comes to us through sacraments. So what is a sacrament? Some of you may remember a, a textbook definition of sacraments uh, that used to be much more popular. Uh, it was that a sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Jesus to give grace. Now, it's helpful because it's a, a, a quick formulaic definition, but what do those, those terms even mean? An outward sign of what? Instituted by Jesus to give us grace. What in the world is grace? Right? Grace is God's own life living inside of us, right? So Jesus started these, there's seven of them, these seven things, seven tangible, sensate ways for God to get inside of us, right? Uh, and so they are outward signs of an inner reality. Right. It's a it's a, a, a symbolic, uh, a symbol that brings about what it symbolizes. Right. So uh, think of baptism. There's water involved in it. The water symbolizes cleansing and it actually brings it about. Think of communion. There's this bread and this wine. They symbolize food and nourishment and they actually bring about spiritual nourishment. Right. There's a, a sensate, almost tangible something to each sacrament. The only one that doesn't involve something tangible is confession, the verbal confession of our sins is the, the sensate stuff of the sacrament, right? Think about Christian marriage for a second. It's the husband and the wife that are the sensate thing through which God communicates himself in that relationship. So you are the vehicle of God's grace in your household. That's a pretty awesome thing, right? So that's what sacraments are. Every sacrament involves certain gestures that communicate God's grace to us and certain words that change reality. Now think about that for a minute. On the surface of it, that's a strange concept. What Father does at the altar every Sunday, those words that he says actually change reality so that what used to be bread is now God's body. That is weird on some level, right? Where in your ordinary life do our words have the power to transform reality? Well, they actually, it happens all the time, right? Think about uh, if a, a police officer were to walk into your house right now and say, you are under arrest. It's a very different thing than if I said you're under arrest, right? If I say you're under arrest, you can say you're out of your mind. But if a duly deputized minister of the law walks into your house and says you're under arrest, you are in fact under arrest. Reality has changed. And then we've got to sort out what did you do and how do we get you out of this mess, right? Our words have the power to change reality. It happens all the time. If your boss says you're fired or you got the promotion, reality has just changed, right? Uh, when you, you shared with each other the awesome news, I'm pregnant, reality has changed, <laughs> right? Will you marry me? Reality has changed. And we can go on and on and on through these things, right? But when the right person says the right thing at the right time with the right intention, our words have the power to change reality. The same thing is true of a duly deputized minister of Jesus Christ. So when the father, the priest or the deacon pouring water over your little baby's head says, I baptize you in the name of the father and of the son of the Holy Spirit, reality has just changed. All right. So that's what sacraments are. There are these, these moments when reality changes. So what specifically happens in baptism? Baptism is this symbolic washing that brings about a real washing and cleansing and rebirth. Think of all the things you associate with water, right? Think of uh, you need water to live. So life. Uh, think of cleansing. We, we shower and bathe on a regular basis, I hope, right? Uh, but also think of, uh, we're, we're approaching hurricane season now as I'm recording this video, right? The, the destructive power that is in water, right? All of these symbols are meant to be evoked in the use of water in baptism. Water cleanses us. It brings new life. It also destroys something in us, namely sin, original sin, or if you're old enough to have committed sin, actual sin. Now, some people get hung up on this, this concept of why does my baby need to be cleansed of sin? My perfect little innocent baby hasn't committed any sins yet. We all inherit a defect from our first parents, from Adam and Eve. Think back to the Garden of Eden. Um, you've all heard this story before, I hope, from Genesis chapter 3, where God gives them one simple, crystal clear commandment. Don't eat from this tree. And they willfully chose to do it and broke human nature and they pass on a defective human nature. 
right? Think about it for a second. Human beings, we're the only thing in all of creation that can willfully choose to violate our nature. I can't think of a tree out there that every spring has to decide, will I produce leaves or will I just not do it this year? <laughs> right? A tree can't say, I'd rather not go through the hassle of leaves, they're just going to fall off eventually anyways, and I'll have to make new leaves, I'm just not going to be bothered with it. Well, you're a tree, you need leaves to live. No, I'd rather not do it. But you and I can choose to do that. I, would, I, I can choose. I'd rather not love right now. I'd rather not engage in somebody else's betterment right now. Uh, it's easier and more comfortable for me to just be selfish and angry and focus on me, forget about others. We do it all the time, right? That's that seed, that origin of sin in us that we inherited from Adam and Eve, right? And that's what baptism is there for. It's a cleansing of this original sin. We're all still attracted to sin. Baptism doesn't take away the attraction, but it takes away that defect of sin. So you can kind of think of original sin not necessarily as a mark on us that needs to be washed away, but more like a hole that needs to be filled in. It's something that's not there that should be there, right? So that might help us uh, wrap our minds a little bit around what happens in baptism washing away original sin in our perfect, beautiful, spotless baby. Think about this. One of the first, thing that ha first things that happens after childbirth, when you see your beautiful, perfect baby son or daughter for the very first time, one of the first things that happens is the nurses whisk that child away and give this child a bath, right? So to your eyes, mom and dad, this is a beautiful, perfect, spotless baby, but they're giving it a bath. Baptism is your child's first spiritual bath, right? To clean up their soul uh, and to, to, to make room in there for God to live. That's an awesome thing, right? So baptism is this, this first washing. It causes your baby to become a child of God. So they become your child, right? They're your child from conception. They become God's child in a uniquely special way at baptism. At baptism, God chooses them. It's almost as, as if God adopts them as his own son or daughter. And he starts to live inside of them. Your child becomes a walking, well, not yet, but a living, breathing tabernacle, right? Where God lives inside of them. Think about that shiny gold box in the church where when we walk in, we all genuflect to it. We have candles lit around it in reverence. Priests and altar servers bow to it every time they cross in front of it. That's what your child becomes. God lives inside of them because of baptism, right? That's an awesome thing. Uh, and they become children of God. If God is the king of the universe, the king of heaven, what do they become? They become princes and princesses of heaven. That's an awesome thing, right? And it leaves a permanent mark on the soul, right? Theologians call this the baptismal character. It's a mark that will never, ever go away, even if, God forbid, your child renounces their faith. Their soul is going to be forever marked as a Christian, and they'll be forever saved in heaven or damned in hell as a baptized Christian with this mark on their soul. Because something at the level of, of being, an ontological change, happens in the sacrament of baptism. It's a big deal that goes on here in baptism, right? And it's our response of faith in Jesus. When Jesus talked about baptism, he always talked about um, believing and being baptized, right? And in the book of Acts, when people ask Peter, the first pope, uh, we hear this message you're talking about, this Jesus who wants to have this relationship with us, we're in, what do we do? <laughs> he says, repent and be baptized. So the question for you about your, your infant son or daughter is, can they repent of anything? Can they choose to believe in anything? Can they choose to follow Jesus? Well, no, they can't. It's your choice that stands in for your son and daughter. Right? It's our choice that stands in for our own children as parents. That's our, our spiritual right as their, their mothers and fathers. Right? Think about this. In the Gospels, there's plenty of times where Jesus heals somebody and he says, your faith has healed you. But there's one instance in particular where there's this paralyzed guy, this quadriplegic, and his friends bring him in on this mat. They're trying to get to Jesus, and there's this crowd. They can't get there, so they climb on the roof. They tear the roof apart, and they lower him down in front of Jesus. And Jesus looks at the guy, and he looks up at them, and he says, Your faith has saved him. And then he tells the guy, Get up and walk. Now, he was an adult. He was perfectly capable of faith and perfectly capable of believing in Jesus and giving some sort of assent of faith. But Jesus looked at the friends, and he says, It's because of your faith that I am healing him and forgiving him his sins. So, buddy, get up and walk. Right? Their faith stood in for his. That's exactly what happens in baptism. It's your faith and it's my faith that stands in for our children. That's a scary thing if you think about it. What is the state of my faith? Do I, need, do, do I have a perfect faith that's going to stand in for my kid? Is their baptism going to be defective because my faith isn't good enough? Here's what the church says about the faith that's necessary for baptism. This comes out of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1253. It says this, the faith required for baptism is not a perfect and mature faith, 
but a beginning that is called to develop. So your baby isn't capable of this ascent of faith. You are, and it doesn't have to be a perfect faith. It's a beginning that is called to develop. Remember, Jesus said faith the size of a mustard seed is, is all he needs. It's the minimum for what he needs. So as you're preparing for your child's baptism, it's worth taking a step back and thinking, what is the state of my faith? Do I believe in God as a person? Do I know him as a person? Or is he a character in a book? Uh, or is he this, this strange being that I, I would really rather not, not deal with? All right, the way that we think about God colors the way that we relate to him. If you think about God as a, a, a lawgiver, you might approach him with a whole lot of fear and trembling. If you think about him as a loving father, you'll approach him a whole lot differently. So as this video comes to a conclusion, I'd like you to discuss with each other, what is the state of my faith? Uh, is there an issue that I need to, to find some answers to that I need to work out? You should ask questions of your faith. Don't let the, the word mystery be a trump card, right? How can God be three? Well, it's a mystery. Don't worry about it. No, a mystery is an invitation to ponder. So what are the things that you need to ponder and try to find some real answers to? Do you have trouble with what you think the church is teaching on uh, whatever, insert your favorite issue here might be? I would encourage you to look up the church's actual teaching on it and try to you know, email me, talk to one of the priests, try to figure out, work to a, a resolution on this issue. So what is the state of your faith right now as you prepare to have your son or daughter baptized?